President Tomka, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the launch um, of what's technically both a volume and a book series, the book series Shared Responsibility in International Law. This is a book series published by Cambridge University Press emanating from a five-year research project at the University of Amsterdam, funded by the European Research Council. Now you may ask yourself what topic in international law might actually merit um, a whole book series consisting of at the minimum five volumes, um, but most likely more will follow. But after having studied this topic for over four years, I have come to the conclusion that indeed the topic of shared responsibility does merit a exhaustive, comprehensive analysis which indeed takes more than a few volumes to cover. Of course, we can examine it in the narrow sense of responsibility for wrongfulness, as the case, cases arise in the International Court of Justice, in Corfu Channel, in Nauru, in legality and the use of force. And much of the first volume that we present today is on that topic. But in later volumes, we also will cover other questions. We will explore what, in those cases where the law is undeveloped, unclear, what normative considerations can play a role in the allocation of responsibility between multiple parties. Fairness, efficiency, perhaps power, others. And then we have a whole separate volume on what we call the practice shared responsibility, where we examine for over 40 different issue areas how in particular regimes, states and other actors have gone about in allocating responsibility between multiple parties on the assumption, on the assumption that there are significant differences based on the nature of the issue, the nature of the interest at stake um, in the process and contents of the sharing of responsibility. But before we, would, before we would get to all of that, and then beyond that actually there will be separate volumes on causation and a member state responsibility of organization, but we, before we would, could, could get to all of that, we would need to lay the groundwork first. And for international lawyers, speaking of international responsibility has to mean that we start with the law as written up by the International Law Commission. Much has been said on the limitations of that body of law, both as they apply to states and to international organizations. But we can, we can simply not remove ourselves from a world where for courts and governments, the text of the IOC are the leading text in any considerations of questions of responsibility. So our first step in this very ambitious project was to engage in a critical inquiry on how we should appreciate, assess the law as handed to us by the IOC from the perspective of shared responsibility. Are the articles useful? Are they limited? And where are the gaps and the opportunities for development? And before I hand the floor to the main speakers of our event, I first invite the, my co-editor, Ilias Plekker-Gefalos, um, with whom I spent many, many hours on the conception of this book, to briefly summarize some of the main conclusions as these have emerged from this first volume. Ilias, please. Thank you, Andre. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. It's a very nice occasion, I think. Um, I will try to be very brief uh, concerning the conclusions. There were the first and main question is what did we expect when we started this process of editing the book in terms of, of the outcome? We didn't have a very uh, clear idea, to be fair. We knew that there were some problems. We didn't know exactly how they would play out in the context of the Articles of State Responsibility. I think that there is another arching conclusion that the articles were definitely not designed to cope uh, with these situations. I know that this doesn't say uh, much, but this is, this is uh, the truth and um, it is uh, 
evidenced by the fact that you have only two articles, one in the Articles of State's Responsibility and one in the Responsibility of International, international Organizations that address the issue of multiple uh, wrongdoing parties, Article 47 and 48, <clears throat> even though they actually deal with invocation, strictly speaking, right? They don't deal with the determining responsibility and so on and so forth. Following this broad realization that the articles were not built, were not structured to deal with these uh, problems, the conclusions can be grouped in under three main headings. One, facilitation. Two, guidance or lack thereof. And three, obstacles. In other words, the ILC articles partly facilitate situations of shared responsibility and make it easy uh, to determine shared responsibility. Second, they may guide, they may offer some limited guidance with a lot of room for maneuvering. And third, they pose some very clear obstacles. In terms of facilitation, we can say that uh, uh, this, this is true exactly because, well, the, the problem of not being structured in order to deal with shared responsibility at the same time means that there's a lot of room there to come up to accommodate uh, these issues. An example it could be breach or also attribution where you have basically no problems uh, uh, finding a breach or attributing conduct to multiple uh, parties. Uh, complicity, for instance, is a paradigmatic example of a, of a principle that enables shared responsibility. It's built in the, the article, shared responsibility is built in the article on complicity. Some issues can be found in circumstances precluding wrongfulness, which seem to operate on the basis of an assessment of conduct of individual actors. But then again, they can be tweaked easily enough in order to accommodate most issues. Turning to guidance, there are two main, main points. First, that the Articles of State Responsibility and Responsibility of International Organizations are fairly general. So they leave room for lex specialis, they leave room for a number of arrangements that can help us determine shared responsibility. The second uh, point is that the nature of shared responsibility itself is quite open-ended. We have a very broad definition, so we can bring many issues under that sort of umbrella uh, term. But this also means that there, that there is a number of issues that are not answered. And they keep coming back in most of the chapters of the book. One is causation. There is no definition of causation. There is no causal standard set by the articles. And it, it is a problem when you have multiple uh, uh, actors contributing to a single harmful outcome. Second is we have a lack of quantitative criteria by which to apportion responsibility to all actors involved. Third, obstacles. The main problem is that you have a number of harmful outcomes that remain below the threshold required to establish them as a wrongful act, and also the converse problem that you have conduct that can contribute towards a harmful outcome and itself is not, uh, cannot be termed as a wrongful act. Um, an example is given, I think, in the, in the, in the chapter on breach, where uh, it is stated that there is no hint, for example, in the question of composite acts, that the single act or omission forming the composite act could be lawful or would be lawful. Another issue that keeps coming back is the exclu exclusivity of uh, attribution. Sorry, Francesco. <laughs> uh, the opposability criterion in the complicity article, for example, is another clear obstacle to uh, facilitating um, the determination of shared responsibility. And always we have issues that go beyond responsibility proper in terms of processes and uh, jurisdictional issues and dispute settlement bodies that may, in the end, not allow a clear determination of who is responsible among the multiplicity of actors. I think I will stop here. Uh, this gives a fairly good overview of what have we uh, what, what are the conclusions of this, of this volume? And also, I think and I hope that it leaves open the door for further research uh, on the topic. Thank you very much. OK, it's my great pleasure to invite President Tomka, President of the Indian Court of Justice, to speak on the topic. Um, as most of you will be aware, um, the ICJ has had its share of important cases involving at least potentially shared responsibility. And I look forward to hearing just Tom Kass views on that. Yes.
Uh, good afternoon, <coughs> dear Professor Nolkemper, dear Dr. Plakokefalos, and your contributors, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to be here uh, this afternoon at the launch of Principles of Shared Responsibility in International Law and the Prize of the State of the Art. I'm delighted because it reminds me of my studies at the law school, as we had a special seminar on Articles on State Responsibility. But as this was in the late uh, 70s, we analyzed only less than 35 articles, as Argo has not yet completed fully his work before coming then to the court. And this also reminds me of my time when I joined the International Law Commission, because another great international lawyer was in charge, who is shortly going to join the court, James Crawford. Uh, and I joined the commission in 1999, when uh, the commission was involved in its work, uh, second reading uh, of articles on state responsibility, and Crawford taking a little bit more pragmatic approach and cutting down a little bit the very elaborate scheme uh, produced by more theoretical approach, uh, followed by Roberto Argo and uh, Willem Riphagen and um, Gaetano Aranjo Ruiz. And by some coincidence, in 2001, I was uh, uh, asked to chair the drafting committee of the commission when these articles were finalized. Although I'm not claiming authorship, I fully admit that the, this is the masterpiece of James Crawford. <laughs> uh, well, I'm happy that, that this book uh, has been prepared, and I understand that shared responsibility is uh, defined uh, as uh, involving uh, situations where a multiplicity of actors contributes to a single harmful outcome, and legal responsibility for this harmful outcome is distributed among more than one of the contributing actors. As the introduction to the book analogies, we live in a world in which states cooperate frequently and often act together on the international plane, including through international organizations. Inevitably, situations will arise in which uh, there are allegations that the conduct of some or all of those uh, actors uh, has breached international uh, law, more precisely international legal obligations. It is therefore important to be able to determine how responsibility for any such breaches of international legal obligations should be allocated between uh, these uh, different actors. Uh, as is well known, the International Law Commission finalized its articles on uh, the responsibility of states for international wrongful acts in 2001. The articles provide some general guidance on the issue of shared responsibility, particularly Articles 47, which makes reference to the possibility of multiple states being responsible for the same wrongful act, and provides that the responsibility of each may be involved, subject to the injured state not recovering more in terms of compensation than the damage it has suffered, and without prejudice to recourse against the other states alleged to be responsible. However, despite uh, the articles making an important contribution to the codification and progressive development of the rules state responsibility as a whole. It has been suggested that, uh, and I quote, the principles applicable to cases of shared responsibility are not well, well developed, and that the International Law Commission has provided limited guidance as to the allocation of responsibility or reparation in cases where acts could be attributed to more than one state. It is uh, this perceived gap that the chapters of this new book seek to fill. They step carefully and comprehensively through various rules of state responsibility, including those relating to breach and attribution, complicity, circumstances precluding wrongfulness, reparation, and invocation of state responsibility. The contributors undertake nuanced analysis of these rules and make sort of suggestions as to how they may be applied in the context of shared responsibility. In this respect, this publication represents a welcome and timely effort to address some of the interesting and complex issues arising in the law of state responsibility today. I have no doubt that uh, this book will be an important and useful text for both scholars and practitioners. The decision of the International Court of Justice and its predecessor, the Permanent Court of International Justice, have played a key role in the development of the law relating to state responsibility 
as a whole. Mm, because of the paucity of uh, general rules on questions of shared responsibility, scholars have often looked to decisions of the court in order to try to elucidate principles that can be applied more broadly under international law. Like other international judicial tribunals, the International Court of Justice has encountered issues of shared responsibility that have arisen in the cases that have come before it. To take just a few examples of cases decided by the court and cited in the literature on shared responsibility, the Corfu Channel case concerned damage done to British ships in Albanian waters where a third state, Yugoslavia, was alleged to have led the mines that caused the damage. The Nauru case concerned a claim brought by Nauru against Australia as one of the three members of the authority administering the territory under the relevant trusteeship agreement, the other two states being the United Kingdom and New Zealand. In the East Timor case, the acts of Indonesia were relevant in a case brought by Portugal against Australia. And uh, originally 10, later eight legality of use of force cases brought by Yugoslavia against various members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization concerned military operations engaged in, uh, by that organization and uh, a number of its members, and therefore could have raised questions not only with respect to the conduct of each state against which a claim was brought, but also with respect its membership more broadly. The organization not, of course, capable of being the respondent in view of access to the court in contentious uh, cases being limited to state parties to the court. Thank you. In terms of more recent cases, potentially raising issues related to the contact of states and organizations not before the court, authors have referred, among other cases, to the application of the interim court case. Uh, um, which arose in the context of former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia's intention of becoming a member of North uh, Atlantic Treaty Organization and Greece's opposition to extending the invitation to that state to join. And of course the decision taken by uh, the organization itself at its summit in Bucharest. The Belgium versus Senegal case were decisions by other courts and organizations form part of the factual framework of the dispute. In addition, we might note that just this year, a number of applications were filed by the Marshall Islands against states relating to the alleged failure to comply with obligations with respect to nuclear disarmament. However, the manner in which the court addresses such issues and the kind of contribution it can therefore be expected to make to the clarification and the development of international legal rules relating to questions of shared responsibility must be viewed in the broader context in which the court settles international disputes. The cases I have already noted demonstrate that the court has been faced with many situations in which the actions of other states, international organizations, or non-state actors are, to a greater or lesser extent, are relevant to the dispute that is before the court and at least some cases in which the dispute gives rise to questions as to the responsibility of such actors for allegedly internationally wrongful acts. It is therefore not uncommon for the court to be faced with disputes between two states that form only an aspect of a much broader controversy and which may well involve multiple other actors. It seems likely that the court will continue to receive applications concerning such cases in the future. On the one hand, as it is the case with, in respect of its power to deal with disputes more generally, the mere fact that a particular case is a part of a wider conflict does not itself rule out the court rendering a decision. Indeed, in this respect, Article 59 of the court statute is protective of states which are not party to the actual dispute before the court, providing that uh, the decisions of the court has no binding force except between the parties and in respect of that particular case. On the other hand, unlike some other international judicial tribunals, 
which have a degree of compulsory jurisdiction, the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice is always based on the consent of state. This situation means that in a case that concerns the actions of multiple entities, the court may not have jurisdiction over each of them, which could impact upon the possibilities available to it to rule on its use of shared responsibility. Most prominently in this regard, the court has indicated that it will be wary of exercising its jurisdiction in a particular case, where to do so would require it to rule upon the conduct of a state that is not a party to the case before it. In the well-known monetary gold case, in which the principle was first elucidated, which is usually referred to by the same name, the court indicated that it would not rule in a case where the very subject matter of the decision is the legal interest of a third state and where the vital issue to be settled concerns the international responsibility of a third state, as to do so would run counter to the well-established principle that the court has Mm, can only exercise jurisdiction over a state with its consent. It is apparent that this principle can preclude the court from rendering a decision in a case that might be described as one of shared responsibility. <coughs> Such was, uh, for instance, the outcome in the East Timor case in which the court considered that Indonesia's rights and obligations would constitute the very subject matter of the judgment sought which would be made in the absence of that state consent. Nonetheless, the principle does not preclude the court from ruling on all cases in which issues of shared responsibility arise. In the Nauru case, for instance, the court said that, and I quote, in the present case, a finding by the court regarding the existence or the content of the responsibility attributed to Australia by Nauru might well have implications for the legal situation of two the two other states concerned. But no finding in respect of that legal situation will be needed as a basis for the court's decision on Nauru's claims against Australia. Accordingly, the court cannot decline to exercise its jurisdiction. And the court's decision on jurisdiction perhaps influences Australia to be a little bit more flexible in subsequent negotiation and settling the case out of court and paying compensation. Uh, and it was then for Australia to be in touch with uh, New Zealand and the United Kingdom as far as uh, uh, allocation of that uh, compensation is, was concerned. The record is not prevented from acting in all cases which might be described as the ones of shared responsibility, tends to suggest that there may be a distinction to be drawn between different types of shared responsibility arising in different factual scenarios, a distinction that has been elucidated in the scholarly literature, including in various chapters in this book. However, even where the court is not precluded from acting, the absence of other parties may impact on its ability to allocate responsibility as between those states. So, for instance, in the Nauru case, while the court indicated its uh, readiness to rule on the case generally, it noted that, and I quote, the present judgment does not settle the question whether reparation would be due from Australia if found responsible for the whole or only for part of the damage Nauru alleges it has suffered. These questions are to be dealt with at the med stage. As I already indicated, as the case was then settled, uh, no uh, decision, no pronouncements was made by the court on the merits. As the chapter in this book notes, whether or not the court would have been able to rule on such issues should the merits have been reached will never be known as the case was ultimately settled. This brief overview indicates that the court faced with a number of cases involving aspects of what might be called shared responsibility has assisted modestly in the development of principles in this area of law. It has been prepared to rule on particular cases which form part of a broader factual context, including the actions of other entities than the parties before the court. Nonetheless, where third states are not before it, the court is necessarily limited in its ability to outline comprehensive principles for the allocation of responsibility between the parties that are before the court and such third states. Moreover, 
In some cases, the code will be precluded from acting altogether and thus from developing the law in this area because of the absence. The court can therefore only ever be one actor assisting in the development of this important area of international law. It is in this context that the importance of scholarly works such as this book comes to the fore. While state practice and treaty law are the bedrock of international legal development, new ideas, solutions, and innovations emerge through academic work, particularly in complex and underdeveloped areas of the law, such as this one. This work therefore provides a significant contribution to the literature in this field, and will no doubt serve as a starting point for many future discussions on the topic. I offer my heartfelt congratulations to all who have been involved in this uh, creation uh, and uh, publication of the book. I'm already looking forward to the future volumes which will follow. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, President Tomka. Let me use this moment to launch, in a technical sense, the yeah. book by presenting you with the very first thank edition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you can find the book when the Marshall Islands case um, for consideration will We have to overcome a hurdle. Uh, <laughs> jurisdictional objections. Um, I now invite um, Pierre Dajan, um, University of Louvain, uh, one of the authors of the book, and of course as editor I have to be equal, and all chapters are of equal weight. But I can say this is a particularly interesting chapter on reparation, because the question how reparation is to be allocated to multiple parties is particularly complex and interesting. And um, Professor Dajan will give, I guess, a brief overview of his main arguments in this chapter, to give you a first feeling of what the book actually is like. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Alve. Well, ladies and gentlemen, President Tomka, I uh, first would like to, to thank you, Andre, for your invitation. I feel very privileged to be chosen among the various uh, writers, contributors to the book to uh, uh, participate in this, in this lounge. Um, and uh, I feel uh, extremely privileged to take the floor after President Tomka. Now, I would also like to congratulate not only you, Andre, but Ilyas also for the book and the entire uh, team of the SHARES uh, project. Uh, my uh, chapter is entitled Reparation, Cessation, Assurances and Guarantees of Non-Repetition. Yes, everything is in there. Um, and I've been asked to I was tasked by André to uh, review the adequacy of the ILC articles on state responsibility and on the responsibility of international organizations to address those secondary obligations arising from uh, internationally wrongful acts in situations of shared responsibility and those situations of shared responsibility are defined in the project, as President Tomka has uh, just recalled, as situations where multiple actors are responsible for their contribution to a single harmful outcome. What I've done in the book is to talk about those uh, substantive uh, secondary obligations of reparation, cessation, assurances and guarantees of non-repetition where those multiple actors are states and international organizations have not addressed situ possible situations of shared responsibility where uh, some or all of the actors involved are individuals or corporations. Um, I, I've not, uh, for, the sake, for, for the lack of space in the book, and maybe the issue will be addressed in, in later uh, books, but I concentrated myself on uh, the uh, draft articles of the ILC and of, uh, for states and international organizations and tried to see to what extent those uh, draft articles indeed cover uh, the topic adequately or, or, or not. Uh, now, for the purpose of this presentation, I shall not speak about uh, all those secondary obligations, but I will concentrate on, on reparation. 
so that's another uh, proviso. So the purpose is uh, simply to try to, to know who owes what to whom in terms of uh, reparation in uh, the complex situations of shared responsibility where you have a plurality of states or a plurality of states and or organizations that are responsible for uh, uh, well, one or several wrongful acts, I'm going to come to that, uh, at least a single harmful outcome. In the first section of this chapter, I try to map out the reasons for uh, the complexity of, of, of such a question. And I think the complexity of shared responsibility um, arises uh, for two reasons. First, because there are two uh, types of attribution of, uh, uh, under the laws of state responsibility. Responsibility uh, is regulated by either attribution of conduct or attribution of responsibility. And attribution of conduct are the basic rules in the INC work according to which the activity of human beings is attributed, imputed to uh, moral beings that are states and legal entities that are states and international organizations. And those rules on attribution, of course, I'm not commenting about uh, on. And the other uh, type of attribution under the ILC work is not attribution of conduct, but attribution of responsibility. Those are the situations in which the responsibility of one entity arises in connection with the act of another one. And those are mainly uh, the questions of aid and assistance, direction and control, coercion, and in the case of international organization, the circumvention of international obligations. Uh, responsibility in connection is not an issue of attribution of conduct, but of attribution of, of responsibility. In domestic law, parents are made responsible in relation, in connection to the conduct of their children. They are, the action of the child is not attributed to the parent. It is, of course, a legal uh, attribution of responsibility by law. Well. To a certain extent, one can look at those issues of responsibility in connection with the act of another subject uh, with the same um, notion in, in, in mind. Those are situations of attribution of conduct, uh, of attribution of responsibility to be distinguished from conduct. The other reason uh, for complexity, and those two reasons are intertwined, I think, but they have to be distinguished, is that. Uh, Complexity can arise because several wrongful acts have been committed or responsibility either as a matter of attribution of conduct or as a matter of attribution of responsibility. Responsibility exists in relation to several wrongful acts or in relation to the same wrongful act. And I think one has to uh, clearly distinguish and the contribution is based on this kind of summa divisio, uh, on uh, the difference between the situations where several actors are responsible because either as a matter of conduct or as a matter of, uh, of responsibility, because several wrongful acts have occurred. And other situations where either as a matter of conduct or as a matter of attribution of responsibility, several uh, states or international organizations are responsible for the same uh, wrongful act. So what is, a, a, and I have called A-type situations, situations where several wrongful acts uh, have occurred, and B-type situations, situations where only one wrongful act has occurred. And what is quite peculiar is that the ILC work only deals with the B-type situations. Uh, article 47 of the uh, article on state responsibility, for instance, or, or, or the only situation where a plurality of states uh, are considered to be responsible are situations where the same wrongful act uh, has uh, occurred. Now, uh, I think the A-type situations are uh, most common, situations where several wrongful acts have occurred. And to take an example, uh, one can imagine that one state abducts a foreign national abroad and transfers that person to a third state where that person is tortured. You clearly have several separate wrongful acts resulting in one 
wrongful outcome. Uh, and you have uh, a situation where several wrongful acts have been committed. A situation where the same wrongful act has occurred, for instance, if you have two riparian states having uh, not an international organization with a separate legal personality uh, supervising the river, but a body established by the two states which acts as common organ of the two states, well, if that body, which is not uh, uh, a separate legal entity from the two states, if that separate uh, common organ of the states acts and wrongful acts, well, you will, you will have one wrongful act that will be as a matter of responsibility for the responsibility of uh, two states. So the same and only one wrongful act will have uh, occurred. Of course, reality is by far more complex than those two hypothetical A and B situations. And for instance, taking the abduction case, we can have a, a situation where a person is indeed abducted, transferred to a, a second state, but the abducting state orders the torture to be committed by the third, by the, the, the torturing state. The state directs and controls, and that would be an issue under Article 17 of the ILC draft. Uh, direction and control uh, is a situation where responsibility arises in connection with the conduct of another state, and this is uh, the state ordering uh, the, tor the torture would be responsible itself for the torture. Not only the torturing state will be responsible for torture, but the state ordering torture will also be responsible. And so the same state which has abducted will be responsible for the abduction, considered as a separate wrongful act. And for another wrongful act, which materially has not been committed by itself, but by a third state, the state to which uh, the individual has been transferred and where the individual has been tortured, the state obeying the requirement of the abducting state. So reality, of course, can be extremely uh, more complex, and you will find in reality, using those two hypothetical A and B situations, uh, situations where in reality you have to combine those situations to come to terms with the complexity of the situation. And also you have to realize, and taking the, 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 the question of, of torture is, of course, uh, quite interesting for that matter, uh, sometimes the issue is simply uh, not addressed uh, because the primary norm takes charge of, of the problem. If you take torture, for instance, and if you take the recent cases of the European Court of Human Rights uh, in July uh, this year, uh, the cases relating indeed uh, to the abduction and to the responsibility of Poland in the uh, CIA abductions, well, Article 3 of the, European Court, of the European Convention on Human Rights, as a primary norm, the court says po Poland has breached that obligation because it has not prevented torture on its own territory. So the content of the primary norm, which is a prohibition of torture, entails uh, a duty of prevention on the territory of the state. And Poland is responsible for a breach of Article 3, which is an obligation that goes as far as that. Poland is not responsible for the acts of the United States, but it is responsible for a violation of the obligation uh, uh, as interpreted and understood by the court, the obligation not uh, to torture under Article 3. So sometimes primary norms come into play also uh, in the picture and sometimes prim primary norms will simply, uh, as a matter of, 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 of jurisdiction um, and, and, and as a matter of, of, of uh, available redresses, uh, will be very helpful and the question of the complexity will, will uh, evaporate. Now let me uh, turn to uh, the first A-type situation where several wrongful acts uh, uh, have uh, been committed, or there is responsibility for several uh, wrongful act, acts. Sorry, um, those situations are, are, are uh, situations where one state, for instance, acts, and another state is aiding uh, or assisting that state. As you know, under Article 16, aiding or assisting is a wrongful act uh, distinct from the one that has been aided or assisted 
and uh, Article 16, as it were, contains also a primary norm uh, not to aid or assist in the commission of wrongful acts. And there you would have two states having committed two separate wrongful acts. The fact of acting and the fact of being, uh, uh, and the fact of aiding or, or assisting. So how should the, and there are more situations, I'm not going to, to, to but those are just examples. How should one uh, address the question of reparation when s several wrongful acts are uh, committed, uh, where there is responsibility, let's speak, uh, that, where there is responsibility for several uh, wrongful acts? Well, in the ILC draft, uh, there is nothing uh, on such a situation. Uh, Article 47 does not deal with uh, the plurality of uh, responsible states when there are several wrongful acts. Article 47 deals with the plurality of, of, of responsible states for the same wrongful act. But it's not a problem, in my opinion, and it's not a gap uh, 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 that there is uh, no uh, provision in that regard in the uh, articles, provided, of course, that the general principles are correctly uh, applied. There is no specific rule, uh, because I think there is no specific rule that is required in such cases. And the question of the allocation of the obligation to make reparation will simply be governed by the orderly and reasoned application of usual uh, principles. Now, in the book, uh, I try to address that situation. I first have some developments on the obligation to make full reparation, because in order to understand who has to make reparation, one should be very clear about uh, what the obligation to make reparation means. And I address a little bit the, the issue of causality. Uh, causality which not only governs the existence of the obligation to make reparation, because after all, there is no obligation to make reparation, if there is no causal link between the wrongful act and uh, the injury. Uh, but not only does causality govern the existence of the obligation to make reparation, which is not automatic, it is automatic in the sense that it must not be contractualized, but it only arises, that obligation to make reparation, if indeed there is an injury stemming uh, from uh, the wrongful act. Uh, I think also causality um, governs the existence of the obligation to make a reparation, but also the allocation of its performance, uh, because it is on the basis of causality that apportionment uh, will be uh, decided. And causality in law is never, of course, uh, a natural science appraisal. It, it always reflects human choices and understanding, uh, understanding of what can be required from individuals or collective entities. Thus, as I said, causality plays a crucial role in the limitation and the distribution of the secondary obligation uh, to uh, make reparation in situations where you have a plurality of uh, separate wrongful acts. Now there are two problems, I think, uh, when one turns to the allocation of the obligation to make reparation. First, it is to decide whether each of those wrongful acts are linked with the injury by a causal link. And of course, this is a matter of, 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 of uh, case by case appraisal on the basis of the criteria of directness, certainty, uh, uh, not too remote, etc. But once there is indeed between each of the wrongful acts and the injury a causal link, another question will arise. Us. And that question will be how to articulate those several causes of uh, the injury. And uh, the true problem for shared responsibility lays in the second. Uh, problem, not so much in the first, the first issue of causality in general, which exists uh, in any uh, state responsibility uh, question, where there is an injury. Uh, ba basing myself on the work of Brigitte Stern and on her uh, thesis of 1973, I think there are four ways, four different ways to articulate the various causal links that exist between each of the wrongful acts and the injury. Two of those I'm not going to uh, address because they are actually uh, situations which do not lead to a plurality of uh, responsible, uh, responsible states. 
But the third and the fourth situation uh, that are um, identified by Brigitte Stern are, I think, of interest uh, to us. The third situation is a situation where several injuries result from concurring causes and that their addition seems to create a single injury. And this is called by uh, Stern a situation, well, in French, complementary uh, uh, situation. The various causes are, are, are said to be complementary of each other. Now, Sometimes you will see in ILC work, concurrent, etc. Let us, and there is vagueness in the words that are used and not systematicity between the ILC on state responsibility and the ILC on uh, responsibility of international organization. What is called concurrent uh, by uh, uh, Crawford is sometimes called, uh, called joint and several by uh, Gaia. But doesn't matter. For the, for, for the purpose of this exercise, let's keep the, the, the Stern's uh, uh, word complementary. Causes are said to be uh, complementary because uh, their addition seem to create a single injury. The fourth situation uh, is a situation which he calls cumulative. And each cause is by itself insufficient to produce the single harmful, harmful outcome as it occurred. So two separate ways to articulate the, the plurality of those, causal, uh, 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 those wrongful acts that are in causal uh, uh, link with the uh, injury. Complementary causes uh, can be illustrated by the hypothetical situation that I presented above, uh, earlier, sorry. Above is in the book. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll get short. Uh, in such a situation where causes are said to be to complement each other, uh, the answer is quite simple. It's based on the principle that each entity must be responsible for the consequences of its own wrongful conduct. The ILC says the general principle in case of a plurality of responsible states is that each state is, separate, is separately responsible for the conduct attributable to it. And therefore, it's an issue of apportionment. Apportionment uh, in due proportion to the causal influence of each wrongful act, which will, of course, be extremely difficult uh, and will have to be dealt on a case-by-case -case basis. In a situation and, and, and there in the book I discuss whether the Corfu Channel case is indeed a complementary cause situation or rather a cumulative cause situation. And I think it's a, it is a cumulative cause situation uh, because in the Corfu Channel case, the laying of the mines by themselves is not harmful. So cumulative situations are situations where the wrongful act and each of the wrongful act causes an injury, but the overall pick and those injuries glued together create a single harmful, a harmful outcome. Cumulative causes situation are situations where, quite exceptional situation where the injury is not uh, severable into different harmful outcomes adding to each other, um, uh, and where uh, the several wrongful acts exists, but each of them is causally linked to the injury, but none of them is by itself sufficient to produce the harmful outcome uh, by itself. And then in those situations, the problem will be how to decide on causality. And there are two ways to decide on causality in those situations of cumulative causes. Either you decide on the most approximate, adequate cause, and actually you erase the, plurali the plurality of causes, or you decide the case, and I think it is what tribunals have done most of the time, you decide the situation of cumulative causes on the basis of uh, those causes being equivalent to each other. Meaning, if you take one, the, wrongful, the, the injury as it occurred will not be the same. So there is no injury without the two causes uh, joined uh, together. So this is the equivalence des conditions uh, theory, and on that basis, uh, the Corfu Channel case, I think, uh, is uh, adequately uh, analyzed. Maybe I should stop here and uh, not addressing the situations where the same wrongful act uh, uh, has occurred. There should be a reason to buy the book also. <laughs> <laughs>
there is a re there is more than one reason to buy the book, uh, and 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 uh, and the same wrongful act situation uh, is addressed um, in Article 47, and I comment on that situation. I also try to distinguish those questions uh, of joint and several uh, responsibility, uh, coming to the conclusion that because when several wrongful acts are considered to be cumulative causes of the, the injury, or when shared responsibility stems from the same wrongful act, there is no need uh, to go uh, into an issue of joint and several responsibility, because in those two situations, the victim will be entitled to address a full claim to each of the wrongdoers. So I, I try to, to show that uh, there is probably uh, not a great practical uh, benefit in the development of joint and several responsibility regimes, which in my opinion uh, must always be established by treaty. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. There's a part discussing co-perpetration, whether if you wage a war jointly together, is that an A-type situation or a B-type situation? And I submit this is a situation where several wrongful acts are committed, but a situation that can be analyzed through cumulative causality. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to have been uh, too long. Now, the book has been launched. Let's hope it's going to fly, but I'm sure it's going to fly. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pierre, for giving a proper sense of the complexity um, of the topic. So this wraps it up. Uh, let me, by way of conclusion, thank the, of course, the European Research Council, Cambridge University Press, for publishing a nice book. But also, in particular, the Shares team, many of whom mem whose members are here, and in particular, Martine van Trecht and Jessica, for their invaluable work on the book. And the Thanks to Pierre, thanks to President Tomka, and I invite all of you for um, drinks just around the corner in a room next door. Thank you very much.